Hey everybody, and welcome to the first R Street Cyber 101. Uh, my name is Catherine Waldron. I'm a fellow with the Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats team here at R Street. Um, I have with me today Paul Rosenzweig, who is also a senior fellow here. Um, and we're so excited to welcome you to the first of our new series, uh, Cyber 101, which is aimed at you know, giving people an overview of the basics of cybersecurity. So this is not an event for all you cyber experts out there. It's an event for everyone who's ever had, you know, had cybersecurity or solar winds come up in a conversation and nod like you totally know what's going on when really you have no idea what's going on. Um, so this particular event, uh, we'll start off. I'm going to give a short presentation. Uh, give you guys some basics on cyber, talk a little bit about solar winds, and then we're going to switch over and have a bit of a fireside chat with Paul. Um, so feel free when we get to that section to put any questions you may have into the chat. Um, we'd love to get some audience questions um, and we'll just interrogate Paul about everything related to cybersecurity. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. So cybersecurity, it's a fairly new topic, but a fairly important one. Um, and in a recent study um, at Black Hat USA 2019, uh, security, cybersecurity company uh, Vinafi conducted a survey where they found that the majority of the security community um, agrees that we need you know, more and better cybersecurity uh, pri and privacy legislation but that they didn't trust um, elected officials to actually understand cyber risk sufficiently to craft you know, good, effective legislation. Um, in particular, the, the survey found that 82% um, of those surveyed didn't trust the government to protect their personal uh, identifiable information. And 80% said government officials don't understand the cyber risks to digital infrastructures, whether that's state run or in the private sector. Now, this probably isn't surprising to anyone who has recently you know, watched a hearing um, on the Hill related to anything related to technology. Unfortunately, it's a sad fact that when it comes to tech, to crafting tech and cyber policy, a lot, albeit not all, of our policymakers could probably do with some extra training on the subject. Why is it so hard to craft good cyber policy? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, cyber is highly technical, then that makes it complicated. Uh, it's impossible to be completely secure. So whereas it would be easier to have a discussion if we said, if we do X, X, X will be secure, a lot of times we're working in shades of gray and that makes things difficult. How secure is secure enough? Cyber is a relatively new issue and we lack a lot of good information and good metrics. Um, even though some companies may know like roughly what their cyber security looks like, a lot of times that information either isn't publicly available, it's not aggregated, or there's things we just don't know. Cyber doesn't really neatly align with either side of the political spectrum. Um, and this is actually in many ways a good thing. Um, it means that in many cases there's able, there's able to be like bipartisan agreement on cyber. But the downside of this is that it's not never gonna be any particular party's driving platform. Um, of course, technology is constantly evolving. Um, one, one difficulty when it comes to any sort of tech policy is that by the time you have the policy out there, the technology has sometimes evolved so much that it's obsolete. And the norms of cyber conflict are also evolving. Um, we see a variety of different actors who we'll talk about in a minute engaging in different cyber actions um, and the norms of what counts as um, acceptable behavior, what is verging on cyber warfare, these are still being uh, determined. And so it's hard to know um, how the policy should be crafted. Of course, what happens when we don't have good cyber policy? Um, probably most of you by now can recognize the logo in the middle here. That's the logo for solar winds, um, and which we'll talk about in just a minute. But when we don't have good cyber policy, we end up in bad situations um, because we're not prepared as a nation for what's about to happen. Um, so first, before we do a little bit of a deeper dive into solar winds, um, let's talk about some cyber basics. So starting off, what is cybersecurity? 
cybersecurity is about mitigating risks uh, and deterring threats to devices, computer systems, networks, um, and this can really encompass a large range of things. It means making sure things like your data is encrypted, building a firewall into the system, how your system, the architecture, how it's, how it's uh, structured. Sometimes it means making sure your password is incredibly long and complicated, as I'm sure all of us have had to deal with at some point. Um, and good cyber policy on a national level really shapes how prepared we are for cyber attacks. Um, it can dictate things such as uh, what sort of security protocols or frameworks are required for different government agencies, making sure there's funding available and resources for CISA, the cybersecurity um, and infrastructure security agency, as well as any other federal agencies that work on these issues. Um, it means determining the legal framework that uh, companies and other organizations have to operate in. Um, we don't have federal legislation on data privacy and security, but all states um, at this point have different legislation on data security and data privacy. They have data breach laws. Um, and this helps determine uh, how vulnerable these companies are and also what sorts of information they need to share. And good cyber policy also sets the tone. So if the federal government actively and vocally prioritizes cybersecurity, it helps raise awareness uh, regarding the seriousness of the issue. In many companies and organizations, cybersecurity competes with a whole host of other priorities, it includes people who don't understand cyber and therefore don't want to prioritize it, and people who are more interested in protecting their profits and their bottom line. Um, when there's good cyber policy and good national leadership, it legitimizes the need to focus on and invest in cybersecurity. So I'm sure most of you have at some point had to sit down and go through some sort of cybersecurity training. Um, so we're not gonna spend too much on the technical basics of cybersecurity. But as you can see here, here's a list of some of the most common types of cyber attacks. Um, you have Trojans where you have malware, masquerading as something that is legitimate, denial of service attacks where networks just overloaded so much that the network crashes. Um, phishing, I'm sure at one point, all of us have accidentally clicked on the link you weren't supposed to click on in the email. I know that I have, and I work in this field. Um, and then you have things like man in the middle, which has to do with communication, ransomware, holding a system hostage essentially until ransom is paid. Um, but these are really, well, these are some of the most common types of attack. Uh, honestly, there is really an infinite number of ways that systems can be attacked and cyber, cyber attacks are constantly evolving. Uh, as long as people are out there being creative, um, they're thinking up new ways uh, to attack our systems. And so this makes cybersecurity really difficult um, because we, there, in some ways we're already always one step behind. So who are the bad guys when it comes to cyber? Well, the US faces a variety of different threat actors. Um, and we can talk about different types of threat actors by looking at a couple different questions. You know, why are they hacking? Are they after money? Are they after prestige? Is it a political reason? Um, what sort of resources do they have? Um, if they have, they're highly resourced with longstanding strategy and particular goals, they're often what we call an advanced persistent threat. Um, and when it comes to the bad guys, they're often non-state actors and state actors. So non-state actors include things like cyber criminals, crime groups, uh, hacktivists who are using um, malicious cyber activity to make a sort of moral or political point, um, and amateur hackers. And that's typically what we think about when most people think about cybersecurity. They're thinking about the teenager in a hoodie um, in their parents' basement. But actually the majority of cybersecurity isn't amateur hackers, um, at least not the majority that we need to be concerned about. So who are the really bad guys? Okay, so when it comes to nation state actors, there are really four countries um, that are we're, we're most concerned about when it comes to national security and cybersecurity. So the top two, um, probably easily recognizable to most of you, are China and Russia. And both of these countries engage in uh, malicious cyber activity, but they kind of have different MOs. So Russia is, for example, is very active when it comes to cyber warfare. They meddled extensively in the 2016 elections, like hacking into the Democratic National Committee, um, disseminating misinformation and propaganda online, attempting, and in one case, succeeding in infiltrating voter databases. 
But Russian cyber efforts actually go beyond election meddling. Denial of service attacks have been used in conflicts in Ukraine, Georgia, and Estonia, with attacks shutting down government services, online banking, and utility providers. China, on the other hand, um, while they engage in cyber attacks for both military and economic purposes, um, they're very aggressive when it comes to espionage and stealing intellectual property. So they've engaged in cyber activities to steal large collections of information about Americans, and as well as stealing American intellectual propriety, pro proprietary information in order to uh, bolster their own companies and their own economic prospects. Iran and North Korea are a little different. Um, while Russia and China both have significant non-cyber military strengths, um, Iran and North Korea are very interested in cyber's ability to allow for asymmetric warfare. So cyber has been called by some the great equalizer um, because it allows countries who wouldn't be able to compete with the US in other military domains to suddenly have a much, much stronger um, presence. And North Korea in particular is also interesting because while you know their cyber capabilities can be political, they made headlines in 2014, for those who remember when a group labeled uh, the Guardians of, P of Peace uh, hacked Sony Pictures in response to a then upcoming film, um, the interview that poked fun at uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, but North Korea, actually the majority of their activity in the cyber domain is focused on financial cyber crime, uh, which they use to fund the regime and also their nuclear program. So most of these national, national governments, um, they have their own hackers, but they also sometimes make use of non-state patriotic actors, hackers. Um, and so the line often gets very blurred between is this, in, a, in the case of a cyber attack, is this the case of someone who is formally part of a national government? Um, is this someone who is sort of informally connected? Um, and this can make attribution really, really difficult. So this is a brief list of just some of the notable cyber attacks. Um, probably most of you have heard at least some of the ones on this list. Um, we won't go through every single one, um, but this sort of gives you an idea of just how big a problem this has become lately. This is not just the case of solar winds should be our wake up call. Um, it's really sad in fact that we've gotten here and we have not actually addressed um, and really ramped up US cybersecurity in general. All right, so let's talk about solar winds or the sunburst hack. Um, so solar winds was a supply chain espionage effort. Uh, that means that they targeted, um, the hackers targeted solar winds, which is a company, they targeted their Orion, a piece of software called the Orion program. Um, the Orion program is an IT uh, performance monitoring platform that helps businesses and other organizations manage and optimize their IT infrastructure. So even though they ended up hacking into all these different organizations, the goal of a supply chain espionage is to find the weak link in the chain and then target that. Um, it's become fairly common, a large majority of malicious cyber activity is supply chain oriented. Um, and one of the earlier ones we've seen, the, the sort of target hack that, I meant, that was on the screen earlier, that was one of the first notable cases um, where they managed to target, to target target um, by going through their air conditioning supplier. Um, and so in this case, um, solar, the solar winds and sunburst hack, um, sunburst is the name of the malware for anyone um, who's confused between those two different terms. Um, what happened is actors uh, Trojan malicious code, um, they passed it off as legitimate software updates um, and it wasn't detected and then it got pushed out to customers um, as legitimate software. Um, and SolarWinds stated that around roughly 1,800 customers uh, installed the corrupted update. Uh, and it wasn't just SolarWinds, even though you've probably heard the term SolarWinds sort of used synonymously for the hack, um, SolarWinds wasn't actually the only company involved. Um, threat actors also targeted Microsoft, where they exploited vulnerabilities in their products uh, and their software distribution infrastructure. Um, for example, we saw hackers use 
fake counterfeit uh, identity tokens that allow them to break into Microsoft Office 365 uh, and monitor emails. Um, and actually, around 30% of sunburst victims weren't actually directly connected to SolarWinds. So even though we've used SolarWinds kind of synonymously to mean this entire hack, um, there was a lot more at stake, actually, than just this one company. So who got hacked? Well, this is just a partial list, but the Department of Transportation, the Department of State, the Department of Homeland Security, Defense, Energy, including the National Nuclear Security Administration, Justice, Treasury, Commerce, like the list should be kind of alarming to anyone who hasn't seen this before. Um, these are not small hacks. These are major, major government uh, agencies, many of whom are extremely well resourced. Not all government agencies you know, have equal resources when it comes to defending against cyber, um, but you have sort of the big hitters on this list. And so they were really able to get in deep. Um, in addition, they targeted several state and local governments and they got into a wide variety of companies, including many Fortune 500 companies. Why was this hack so successful? Because the threat actor managed to access, get into the system in, at, by at least September, 2019. And we didn't find out until December, 2020, um, when FireEye, uh, a cybersecurity company actually detected it and notified um, SolarWinds. The malware was able to evade Einstein, which is the Department of Homeland Security's detection tool, in part because the malware was new. Um, it wasn't recognizable. So just as we mentioned before, in terms of cybersecurity, the attacks are always evolving. Well, because attacks are always evolving, we don't always catch them right away. Um, the attack has been primarily credited to the Russian intelligence service, um, the SVR. There's also been some discussion about whether or not it came from uh, what's known as APT, 29 or Cozy Bear, which is a group um, connected to the Russians as well. Um, and it's been quite embarrassing in many ways for the US government. It's, it's quite a huge um, breach. And so for the Russians to be able to infiltrate so much of our government, so many of our government agencies is really quite embarrassing internationally. So what can we learn from this? Well, we're about to talk to Paul and find out what we can learn from this. But I think this has given us a good survey. So Paul, I'm gonna switch it over to you in just a second. Howdy. Hey, so for anyone who's joining in now, Paul is a senior fellow with our cybersecurity and emerging threats team at R Street. And addition, in addition to his work at R Street, Paul manages a small cybersecurity consulting company called Red Branch Consulting. Uh, and he also teaches at the George Washington University School of Law. Previously, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy at the US Department of Homeland Security. Um, and earlier in his life, he was a senior counsel for the Whitewater investigation of President Clinton. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Paul. Thanks for having me. It's always good to be here. <laughs> um, for anyone listening, Paul is joining in from Costa Rica, so he's having um, probably much nicer weather up until recently than I have been having. Um, but Paul, tell me, is there any way we could have actually been prepared for solar winds? Aren't zero day attacks kind of inevitable? Well, the answer to that question is sort of yes and no, as, as with so much in cybersecurity. I mean, the, the no part of it is what you've already alerted to. Uh, zero day exploits, novel attack vectors are uh, impossible to predict by their very nature. And thus, uh, in many ways, failure is inevitable. And uh, we therefore need to uh, kind of accept that reality. And that reality is part of the yes, which is to say that if you know that you know, intrusions are inevitable, that advanced persistent threats like the Chinese or Russian governments are likely to succeed, you can take lots of steps to mitigate the possibilities of success. Um, and also to mitigate the adverse impacts going forward. Uh, to take a, a simple example from, from solar winds, uh, much, of, <coughs> much of the loss was from information leakage that was unencrypted communications. Mm. Encryption comes with some burdens on an enterprise. It makes it harder to communicate, but much of our communication would be much more secure 
if people routinely used encrypted communications channels, at least for their more, more sensitive and um, uh, significant data. A, a lot of the data that was lost didn't need to be stored in server systems that were connected to, uh, to the servers that were impacted. So there are ways to examine your architecture, examine your business processes, and make kind of sensible judgments about how best to minimize the risk of uh, and minimize the harm from failure. So no, we could not have stopped solar winds. It was a particularly uh, pernicious and effective attack precisely because it was so novel that uh, pretty much nobody I know claims to have seen it coming. Um, people saw that solar winds had security issues, but they didn't see this particular instantiation of it. And uh, so we could never have prevented it altogether, but we could have been better prepared for the inevitable adverse consequences. So after the solar winds hack, um, there was a lot of debate about whether or not this should be treated as a cyber attack or a cyber espionage. So why isn't an a hack like solar winds considered an act of war. How do we determine, you know, how far is too far when it comes to, you know, letting enemies infiltrate our systems? Well, you know, in some ways, the question you're asking involves a recurring question that is that is very common in cyber altogether, which is how to uh, adjust old legal and policy concepts to new realities. Um, when I teach at George Washington, I, I call it the problem of pouring new wine into old bottles. And sometimes the new wine fits in the old bottles pretty readily, but other times the fit isn't exact. And the laws of armed conflict, acts of war definitions are a good example of one that doesn't quite fit. The laws of armed conflict were written at a time when we knew what an act of war was, and it was me launching a missile at Washington and killing people with physical kinetic force. That nobody would doubt that that's a, a, an armed conflict. So the question is, what is the cyber equivalent of that kind of physical armed conflict? And there's <clears throat> kind of three possible answers to that. The first is to treat cyber activity as an armed conflict, an act of war, only when it has physical effects. So for example, if I launch a cyber uh, uh, attack on a dam and I break the dam, start a flood and put uh, Las Vegas underwater, the Hoover Dam, right? Uh, that would be an act of war if it was accomplished by a missile from Russia. And it would li likewise clearly be an act uh, of war if it were accomplished by a cyber assault on the Hoover Dam. But cyber has manifestations beyond that. So a second category would be an assault of some sort that had massive uh, effects on the economy or national security of the nation without doing physical damage. The hypothetical that we always like to talk about is, you know, what if somebody wiped out the New York Stock Exchange tomorrow so that all records of stock ownership were wiped out. And that would be a multi-trillion dollar loss to the United States. It would probably drive us into a depression. Um, you know, and there'd be lots of collateral kinetic impacts as people jumped from windows and killed themselves over that or starved to death because of the crash in the economy. But nobody would have been killed in the attack itself. So we ask whether or not something of that nature would be an attack. And you know, the world is split on that. The United States and most Western allies think that something like that would be justifiably considered an act of war. And thus you could respond as if it were the start of a war. And the reason this is important, just as an aside, is that if it's an act of war, you can respond with all the tools in your weaponry. So we can respond to a cyber attack on the New York Stock Exchange by bombing, you know, bombing Kiev or or Moscow or wherever we think it comes from. Uh, 
uh, with real live physical bombs. So that's a big deal. Um, many of the other nations in the world, the majority of them, dissent from America's view and think that acts of war should be limited to physical kinetic activity. Then the third thing, the third kind of category, broad category, is uh, data manipulation, data exfiltration, data theft, data destruction. So that would be you know, stealing emails. Uh, and there's a small minority of people who think that even that could be considered a cyber act of war. But most people seem to recognize that as nothing more than espionage done in the cyber domain. And so uh, where would solar winds fit in that kind of tripart? Clearly it didn't do any physical damage. And depending upon your assessment of the harm done and the extent of the harm done, it probably didn't fit in the second middle category, the New York Stock Exchange category. And so we're left with thinking of it as a really extensive, extreme example of uh, an espionage activity that, uh, you know, Michael Hayden, the, the director of NSA said, if, if we could have done it to the Russians, we would have. Uh, and probably we have, or possibly we have. So in your earlier, the answer to your first question, you talked a little, about, a little bit about how we could have been better prepared for solar winds. We couldn't have stopped it, but we could have you know, had our data better encrypted. We could have had better security architecture in place to mitigate some of the um, impact. And so I think that raises a question, which is when we're building our systems and focusing on federal cybersecurity or any cybersecurity, what should we really focus on? Should we focus on you know, protecting our systems from being penetrated in the first place? Uh, or is it our efforts are our efforts better spent on you know improving the resiliency of our systems, uh, assuming that at some point you know they are going to be hacked into, and so we need to focus on that instead. Can I say both? <laughs> you can. Option A and option B. Listen, you know, maintaining an exterior defense is is like the Maginot Line, right? It didn't work for the French in World War II. And it doesn't work completely for any enterprise. Um, it's gotten harder, not easier over time, especially, you know, if, frankly, in this time of pandemic, because now everybody's outside of the perimeter of your enterprise, your defensive perimeter. You and I are, are calling in from home. Uh, we're using an R Street server. R Street is at risk right now. Uh, your uh, at your home. I'm in Costa Rica. Who knows who's listening in? Uh, so perimeter defense is just the start. Then, you know, you, you kind of skipped one that I want to add, which is interior defense, right? Intrusion detection, prevention, and response and recovery. Uh, Dmitry Alpetrovich, who, who started CrowdStrike, said, and I think he's right, that the real question is not about whether or not you prevent an intrusion, and it's not really even about how well you recover, but how fast you respond. You know, he wants you to detect the intrusion you know, within a few minutes, respond to it uh, in, in just a few more minutes and recover within an hour. That's, I mean, that's an ideal, it doesn't really work that way, but he calls it the 11060 rule um, for, for, uh, for that. And then the third aspect of that is what you would call resiliency. How, Quickly, do we get back up and running? What's our downtime and what's the long-term effects of our downtime? You know, if, if we are a hospital and we lose the capacity to conduct surgery for 24 hours because of a ransomware attack, that's really a lot worse than if our street loses the capacity to have a, a Zoom event for 24 hours. I mean, granted, I know that everybody on this call is absolutely entranced and engaged by our discussion, <laughs> but, but nobody here would die uh, if, uh, if all of a sudden somebody brought us down two minutes from now. Uh, I don't know. I might die of boredom, Paul, so <laughs> speak for yourself. For a hospital, <laughs> yes. you know, that's a different story altogether. Yeah. Um, you raise a good point, but I think one thing you you said that struck my attention is you talked about what's ideal. 
And I think for, in a lot of cases, we don't live in a world in which we necessarily live up to the ideal. Um, so if you could kind of sort of grade the response um, to solar winds, what sort of grade would you would you give the response? Did we do a good job um, or, or how could we have improved? Well, that's a great question. Um... I sort of want to cheat a bit and say that it's still too early to say mm. because the full assessment of solar winds hasn't been made. So we, I, so I don't have a good sense either of the um, the the uh, extent to which we were injured, you know, at, or the extent to which uh, we we could have done better at mitigating it. How much of what we've done would have been, could have been improved upon. Uh, it would seem to me, the, that having been said, offering a, a rough, maybe a C plus, you know. <laughs> that's that's uh, only barely passing. <laughs> a B minus, you know, it, this was, there, the, the response was, um, we had inadequate uh, early warning systems in place. Mm. Uh, and in particular, uh, you know, some of the inadequacies at, at solar wind were known in the marketplace for, for weeks, if not months ahead of time. And so our, our, our response capabilities were just, our, our pre-response capabilities were just not activated the way they should have been. The point that in many ways is these vulnerabilities were known um, well in advance. Why do you think some of the reason is um, that, you know, we knew about these vulnerabilities and they weren't taken care of um, before something like the solar wind hack could happen. Well, in a lot of ways, you're asking a much more fundamental question, which is why is it that, hang on a sec, I got to get rid of the cat here. <laughs> don't pick her up. She will keep bo bothering me. Um, I apologize to everybody who doesn't like cats, but she just was annoying me. Uh, why is it that we systematically underinvest in cybersecurity? Why is it that nobody understands, you know, nobody spends enough and we don't respond to it? There are a couple reasons. I think the first and most obvious is that for most people, cybersecurity is an externality. You know, solar winds' failure was bad for solar winds, but it was a lot worse for the US government and a lot worse for all of solar winds' customers. Um, but solar winds doesn't have to be isn't responsible for that doesn't have to pay to mitigate that and so they invest basically in their own product in a way that that they think will maximize profitability near term you know uh, distribution and marketing and security is always a cost that reduces profit margins right so that's the first reason I think the second reason is is that we're also not really that sure how readily well, how, how best to measure the value of an investment. We spend lots of money on security and then the CEO says, well, am I safer? And the, the chief in, uh, information security officer says, yes. And he said, great, how much safer? And the CISO says, mm, yeah, I really can't tell you, sir. And that's not a formula for winning funding resource battles in, um, in boardrooms or in, uh, the decision-making halls of the U.S. government or anywhere. We need to be driving towards a place where uh, cybersecurity is externalized to the appropriate degree and where it is quantified in a way that allows us to really assess better what we're doing. So as, as for why S solar winds in particular, I, I, again, I think we, we're still sort of waiting to see what the after-action report on solar winds says, but, you know, for a long time, just as an example, uh, so solar winds was known to have sort of underinvested in R and D, uh, mm -hmm. research and development. Uh, you know, I it's hard to draw a causal connection, but I wouldn't be surprised if that bore it to some degree on the on the problem. I'd like to encourage any of our listeners um, who have questions to go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, if you have There's questions, one in the Q and A actually. Hmm? And Vroom. Yeah. Even oh, if yes. it yeah. is not an act of war, it is nonetheless criminal activity, in which case it is somehow a breach of a treaty of some sort. That's an interesting question, Anne. 
Um, there is no international criminal law treaty governing cyber uh, uh, generally. There's something called the Budapest Convention that, as, as the name implies, was signed up for in Budapest. Um, and But all, uh, almost all of the signatories are what you and I would characterize as Western uh, democra democracies. Uh, and they bind, we bind ourselves there to help each other in investigating uh, cyber crime. But notably, just you know, as an example, Russia's not a signatory. China's not a signatory. So they haven't breached any treaty obligation because they didn't undertake one in the Budapest Convention. And it's long been the case in international law uh, that espionage is not an international law violation. In fact, uh, we make international law through what's called the customary practice of nations. And the customary practice of nations is to do espionage. So espionage is pretty legal um, uh, internationally. So it certainly was a breach of what we think of as implicit norms of behavior, but it wasn't really a crime. And the norm was really that it was just so big and so effective, you know? So we've got two questions, one in question and answers and one in chat. I'm gonna go back and forth, right? So uh, unless you wanted to, do you wanna pick uh, Catherine? Uh, no, I think we'll go back and forth. So you've got a, a cat fan. Uh, over in the chat. So I think you should tell them whether the cat is Luke or Leia. Uh, and then also they would like to know, uh, do you think Congress is going to pass some sort of national overarching data privacy and data security standard? Well, first of all, thank you for the cat love. I have two cats. They're a boy and a girl twin from the same litter. They're named Luke and Leia, from which you can probably infer what my favorite movie was when I was 15 uh, or 10, right? Um, as for the uh, data privacy, data security, and whether or not a uh, national overarching law will pass, we have been um, talking about a national data security, data privacy law for 15 years. I am not optimistic. I think we should have one, but I'm not optimistic that we can reach congressional agreement on one. Um, the main, there are two main sticking points, I think. The first is the substantive standards, which is to say that um, there are basically two camps, the make, make the requirements very detailed and onerous and make the requirements very simple and, and a low bar that sets a minimum. Those two camps have not resolved themselves. And then there's the preemption uh, question, which is will a federal standard um, preempt inconsistent state law, which would mean, if it did, that would mean that one federal standard would overwhelm both weaker state laws in some states, but also the stronger data privacy laws in states like California. Um, needless to say, California opposes that. And thus almost all of California's uh, congressional representatives also impose pre oppose preemption. But much of the benefit that business sees in a, in, in a federal law would be the, its uniformity. So they would only have to comply with one standard. And that's a pro preemption argument. Uh, so that's a really tough uh, road, uh, you know, circle to square. And my guess is, uh, is that we'll take another swing at it in, the, in this two years, especially right now, because uh, obviously, you know, the, the House, Senate and presidency are all the same party. And that kind of increases a little bit the possibility of, of agreement, but it's unlikely this would be in reconciliation. So we would require at least 10 Republican senators to go along with this uh, in the filibuster. And so it's still gonna be very hard, I think. What's one question or one assumption, sorry, that cybersecurity policymakers should break with? One assumption that they should break with, that's a really good kind of, yeah, big think provocative question. Um, well, I, I'm going to answer it with two answers, right? Um, the first is that we have been assuming for a long time that uh, the network is going to 
be unitary across the globe. I think that that assumption is dying and that we're going to see the balkanization of the internet into different pieces. And I think that that probably means that we're going to have to be more aggressive at designing an internet and a set of rules that protects and empowers what I would call the kind of liberal free West democracy network, which is you know, unified. And I don't mean just Europe and America. I mean, anybody who kind of believes more or less in free speech, you know, rule of law sorts of things. Uh, we, our openness has allowed its own subversion in some ways as the disinformation campaigns we've been seeing have done. Um, the other assumption that's really actually even more um, uh, uh, notable is that I think policymakers tend to think that they can actually make policy in, can effectively make policy in this area at, at the traditional slow pace of change, right? We are trying to manage a 21st century network that moves at this, uh, you know, with an 18th century governance structure of Congress and committees and judiciary and executive branch. We have not yet figured out how to make decisions at pace. And that's really hard in a world that turns, you know, on a dime where, you know, internet capabilities double every 18 months. And, uh, and yet we still have, you know, a Congress that has, you know, that works with paper records and, you know, some members still don't really have a great technological understanding of what's happening. I'm trying to be polite. There are many members who do, and I want to, you know, be clear about that, but some of our older members and members of Congress and senators are, you know, not really able to grasp that the pace of change here is so great. So we have a question asking for a credible economic argument against funding cybersecurity to the degree that uh, most recommendations suggest, um, which I think is an interesting question. I know that you and I have both done some work on metrics and measurements. So is, is there any credibility and any sort of good argument actually against funding cybersecurity or at least funding it more or just cranking out more money? Well, I mean, I guess there are a couple of moderately re let, let me say first Alexia that that I'm making the argument because you asked me to not because I believe <laughs> these okay um, but um, I mean the first of course is that uh, we don't know what we're we don't really know what we're getting for uh, for our, our money and so there will be a lot of waste and misdirected investment uh, at, at this point if we just throw money at the problem, a lot of it is, is going to result in waste and possibly fraud and abuse. But you know, the, 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 the big triumvirate of, of WFA that, that plagues almost every government program. Um, the second, which is also um, a, a pretty decent argument is that a lot of cybersecurity spending and regulation would be subject to uh, regulatory capture, right? And we would not necessarily get the uh, spending and the regulations that we should have, but rather we would get the ones that the most influential uh, uh, lobbyists would buy. And I mean, and that's true of all regulatory structures right now. Um, uh, and, I, and I guess that actually leads to a third one, which is, which is that given the expense of cybersecurity, one of the reasons why uh, it's underinvested in is that it's a real barrier to entry. Right, startup innovation. If you imposed upon startup innovators uh, cybersecurity expenses as well, it, systematically you'd probably have fewer innovators. And and obviously, innovation is pretty much the hallmark of uh, of what we think of as the virtues of the network. I'm not sure I buy all of those. I certainly think that most of them are answerable, but they're not nonsensical arguments. I would agree with that. And I would also point Alexia, um, since my background is in econ and I've done some dabbling in this area. Uh, if you haven't, there's some interesting academic articles on this subject for anyone who's interested. 
Um, so if you haven't looked up like the Gordon Loeb model, I highly recommend you look that up as well, um, because that actually puts the threshold for cybersecurity spending probably much lower than what a lot of people would look at um, or recommend. However, there's also questions about how accurate it is as an academic model when it comes to like, can we actually measure the cost um, of some of these cyber um, attacks? So um, definitely look into that if you're interested. Um, okay, we have a question. What movements are there, if any, towards more robust cyber agreements with non-Western countries? Well, that's a great question. Um, the UN has uh, been chartering a global uh, engagement amongst experts uh, that goes back now at least eight years. Um, and Catherine, I think you actually attended one or two of their sessions, didn't you? Uh, I attended a, a UN working group session on supply right. chain security, yes. Right, and um, the, the sad truth is that these UN-sponsored efforts to find common ground uh, have uh, not really proven that successful, uh, mostly uh, because um, non-Western nations see it as an effort by the West to kind of impose Western values and limitations on them, and the West sees the non-Western nation's resistance to that as importing uncertainty and uh, attempting to maintain uh, freedom of maneuver in cyberspace. To cite but one example, it took five years for everybody to just agree that the laws of armed conflict will apply in cyberspace. Um, they haven't agreed on how they'll apply, but just the statement they will apply was itself hard enough to, to achieve. So, um, I mean, it really is not surprising when you think about it. The internet is a globe girding uh, uh, network and the world's approaches to all sorts of ethics and moral values and economic uh, things is as diverse as the world. So finding uniform agreement is gonna be very, very hard. Um, sadly, um, I don't think it's gonna prove that successful. So the Department of Defense has had programs like the Defense Innovation Unit and Rapid Innovation Fund to sort of identify emerging capabilities in the private sector um, and ensure government parity to leverage those capabilities. Uh, are there any similar programs for cyber? Um, and do we need to develop similar programs in cybersecurity? The, DARPA has been trying to begin developing those kinds of, uh, of programs. The CIA actually runs a venture capital firm in Silicon Valley called InQtel, where they invest in new, tech, new cyber technologies in the hopes of, of fostering their development. Uh, I think I would say that it's fair to characterize all those efforts as not yet fully developed. And I would say more similar, yes, definitely. So here's another question. Should the cyber, should cyber command be allowed to strike back um, under the retribution concept? What would be any sort of legal issues with this action? Well, yeah, the, the legal issues would be whether or not it was, it, it was, you know, the retribution was sufficiently justified under the laws of armed conflict in the first place. Uh, I think that the more practical question would be what would be the uh, uh, diplomatic uh, 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 repercussions, how would that play in the world stage? The US has for the most part tried to uh, be the better actor in cyberspace, uh, at least until recently. And you know, if we were too aggressive in retribution type activity, we would run the risk of losing the high ground. Now, lots of people don't think that the high ground actually, high moral ground, moral high ground actually exists and that we're being self restrainedist for no reason. Um, you know, I don't think there's any empirical research that says one way or the other whether that's right. So, uh, but I think that the, that the legal issues would be, you know, simply ones of proportionality and necessity 
uh, the traditional laws of armed conflict rules, it wouldn't be necessarily uh, a legal question so much as a practical question. Uh, so we have a question in the chat. Um, so when it comes to countries like Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, do these countries um, they, who have a record of initiating cyber attacks proactively, are they also better than we are at defending themselves from cyber attacks? Um, and how do we need to, how can we address that in our role in international politics? Should we be focused on reducing cybersecurity concerns, establishing norms? What should our goal be? Well, I mean, to take the last of those first, we've been trying um, through the Department of State to foster a discussion about norms and behaviors uh, across the board for many, many years in cyberspace uh, with limited success. You know, for example, we've tried to develop the norm of not attacking the financial network since financial uh, transactions are kind of undergird the entire economy. So far, uh, very few nations have agreed to that. We've tried to suggest that um, norms against attacking hospitals would be kind of like norms against attacking the International Red Cross. Uh, again, to no great success and indeed, hospitals are, have routinely been, been the focus of at least criminal gangs, so though hopefully not nation state attacks. Um, as for whether or not uh, other nations put a, a similar priority on cybersecurity um, and how and are they better or worse at defending themselves? Couple answers to that. Uh, the first, of course, is that uh, the United States is probably more vulnerable than most other nations because the depth of the integration of cyber networks into our economy is greater than anywhere else in the world. I mean, to put it colloquially, North Korea is almost invulnerable to cyber attack because they have almost no cyber networks that are useful in their, in their uh, normal everyday economy. They use it only as an offensive weapon of the communication outside. So, so there's nothing there to really take down, if you will. Uh, some people say that that means that the United States has in effect a cyber glass jaw, if, if to use a, a boxing analogy. Um, the other thing to say about this is that to a large degree, you know, investments in cybersecurity by, by closed authoritarian nations are cloaked to us. Uh, we don't have uh, great intelligence on how much money Russia and China spend on cybersecurity. Uh, to judge by the volume of activity that we see on the networks in, in an attack method, on, on, on the offensive side, one would guess that they invest a fair amount of money in defensive networks as well. And we've seen some indications of that, especially, for example, in Chinese public policy documents in which the, the Presidium has announced its cyber strategy for the next five years and has talked about wanting to have dominance in this information space. Uh, Russia similarly has made similar strategic declarations, which imply a devotion of resources to back up the declared policies. But as to how much, mm, uh, I mean, maybe some other people know the answers to that. Uh, I, I certainly don't. It looks like we're out of questions in the chat and the Q&A. So, and I know we're running short on our time. So I'm gonna, oh, never mind. one just popped up. Uh, we'll answer this and then I'll uh, close this out. But. Uh, Paul, just to drill down a little bit more on the criminality issue, um, if one or more of the hackers could be identified, uh, could the Department of Justice issue an arrest warrant on charges of something like break or breaking and entering? Um, That's a that. great question. And the answer is yes, and we already have, not for solar winds yet, but for lots of others. There is a law, congressionally passed law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that criminalizes um, essentially breaking and entering into computers. I, I, you know, the details are the stuff that lawyers like me really enjoy, but it basically makes it a crime to have unauthorized access to a protected computer. And so uh, the US Department of Justice has issued a number of indictments against foreign actors from Russia, China, and North Korea for their criminal activity in breaking and entering 
into protected networks here in the United States. We've issued red notices to, through Interpol for the arrest of these people. Um, the problem with it, of course, is that we don't have extradition treaties with like Russia or China where they would actually send their criminals to us. And so to a large degree, criminal indictments like this are a signaling event only. We see you, we know what, we're, what you're doing and we can identify you. And it does mean that the actors identified have more restricted travel than they used to. I mean, uh, that this is of course before pandemic made, made it so that nobody traveled anywhere. But you know, in the olden days, a Russian might want to travel to you know, France for a vacation or something like that. And he can't now because he's under indictment in the United States. There's an Interpol red notice for him. And if he ever landed at Orly Airport, the French would arrest him and extradite him to, to us. So there are probably at least a dozen outstanding indictments for all sorts of uh, actions by members of the Chinese People Liberation Army or the Russian GRU or North Korea's cyber uh, corps uh, that are pending. Uh, and you know, someday we may catch one and bring him to justice, but don't hold your breath. So I'm gonna ask you one last question, which is uh, briefly, if you had you know, a cyber magic wand and you could change one thing about how the federal government you know, approaches cybersecurity, what would be the thing you changed? I would have everybody, or at least every representative and staffer who's gonna work on the issue, do a little bit of studying on how cyber systems actually work. Mm. So I, I would actually have them attend Hack the Capitol. The R Street Institute's event on May the 4th, um, where you learn about how hackers actually do this stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's easier to make policy when you have just, you don't need to be a hacker, you just have to understand what the network is and how it works. And I would think that it would be really, really wonderful um, if people who were uh, making policy, whether it's regulation in the executive branch or, or judicial, you know, uh, judges are particularly uh, ill-equipped uh, because they don't understand what's happening um, uh, generally. Uh, an exception, by the way, was yesterday's decision by Justice Breyer, which actually was very technically literate um, uh, in the Google versus Oracle case. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, I would say my magic wand would be uh, cyber, cyber literacy. Mm. Well, that's very important and obviously part of why you're here today. Um, and for anyone who enjoyed this, you should sign up and come uh, to the uh, Hack the Capital event, which we are, our street is co-hosting. Um, as and as you, well as all the other Cyber 101 classes. That yes, we're I was going to say, we'll be back next month with uh, our next Cyber 101. Um, so this is going to be a continuing series. And I believe our next one is going to take a closer look at defensive cyber in the U.S. and what our capabilities are and sort of a who's who. Um, and so if you enjoyed this, if you have more questions, please check back with us next month. Um, thank you for everyone who listened and thank you, Paul, for joining me. It's been great. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.